The first generation earns it, the second generation enjoys it, and the third generation destroys it. This adage rings true for the Vanderbilts, whose colossal fortune vanished into thin air within a few generations. But let's put their wealth into perspective. Imagine filling the largest U-Haul truck you can rent, a massive 26-foot behemoth from front to back, top to bottom, with $100 bills. That's the amount of space you would need to fit $3 billion, which was Cornelius Vanderbilt's net worth in today's money. Now contrast that with what remained for news anchor Anderson Cooper, the great-great-great-grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, a mere $1.5 million which could fit into a box the size of a 30-pack of Pepsi with room to spare. So having the wealthiest family in America, who once had more money than the U.S. Treasury, managed to squander a truckload of cash. To understand this downfall, we need to rewind to the early 1800s. The tale starts with Cornelius Vanderbilt, a boy from humble beginnings destined to alter history. With Dutch ancestors who were modest immigrants at age 11, Cornelius left school to help his father ferry goods in the bustling waters of New York Harbor. Possessing a relentless drive, he sought to carve his own destiny. When he turned 16, he borrowed $100 from his mother, a substantial amount back then and equivalent to $2,500 today, promising to plow a rocky field. His initial step on his path to wealth showcased his determination and foresight. With $100, Cornelius bought a sailboat, launching a ferry service that undercut competitors with fares as low as 18 cents. His strategic pricing repaid his mother's loan with interest, enabling him to dominate the market and earn the moniker, the Commodore. Vanderbilt's ventures expanded beyond the sea, transitioning to railroads and creating the country's largest railroad network. In 1877, at the time of his death, his $100 million fortune valued at around $3 billion today made him America's wealthiest person. Yet Vanderbilt's will left 95% of his wealth his eldest son William Henry Billy Vanderbilt doubting the other family members' capability to manage the empire. Billy doubled this fortune to $200 million, the world's largest at the time. Then why, during the Vanderbilt's inaugural family reunion at their namesake university in 1973, was not one of the 120 attendees a millionaire. We'll answer that question and explain how the complete collapse of the Vanderbilt fortune happened. But first, welcome to Blue Chip Mindset, the winning mindset for success. If you enjoy the video or learn something new, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Following the Commodore's son, Billy Vanderbilt's death in 1885, his immense fortune was split among his offspring. Cornelius Vanderbilt II received $80 million. William Kissam Vanderbilt inherited $60 million while the two younger brothers each got $10 million. They reveled in their newfound wealth. William Kissam, the Commodore's grandson, commenced the monumental construction of Marble House, a luxurious mansion overlooking Newport Cliffs. Costing an astounding $11 million and featuring over 500,000 cubic feet of marble, it stood as a luxurious birthday gift for his wife, Alva Vanderbilt. Primarily serving as their summer retreat, the couple owned several other residences during New York's Gilded Age, a period when the Vanderbilts wielded considerable influence. As wealth multiplied during the Industrial Revolution, the rich formed elite circles governed by a strict social hierarchy that determined entry. Mrs. Caroline Astor, who some later gained notoriety as the wealthiest man to perish aboard the sinking of the Titanic, acted as gatekeepers for the social hierarchy overseeing the influential list of 400. This esteemed list determined which individuals were worthy of entering New York's prestigious high society. Interestingly, despite their considerable wealth, the Vanderbilts were conspicuously absent from this list. Despite being excluded, Alva Vanderbilt, wife of William Kissam Vanderbilt, was determined to secure acceptance into elite circles, no matter the cost. She invested millions from her husband's inheritance to build New York's grandest mansion, the Petit Chateau, completed in 1883 at a total cost of $3 million, approximately $89 million today, hosting an extravagant ball costing $250,000 or $7.4 million today, Alva's gamble paid off as Caroline Astor welcomed her into the elite rank by adding her name to the list of 400. Yet it came at a jaw-dropping cost of nearly $97 million. Legend has it that this is when Cornelius Vanderbilt officially rolled over in his grave. However, this acceptance didn't immediately extend to the rest of the Vanderbilt family. Thus, they embarked on their own mansion-building marathon. From then on, it became a downward spiral of various family members competing to construct the largest and most extravagant homes rarely occupied. Determined not to be overshadowed by his sister-in-law, Alva, Cornelius Vanderbilt II erected an enormous mansion in Newport named the Breakers. 
This stunning residence, perched on a cliff, spanned an acre, boasting 70 rooms across five floors in elegant Italian Renaissance style. Its grandeur was enhanced by a carriage house, stables, and a dedicated team of stable boys. Although the Vanderbilts only visited for a few weeks each year during Newport's vibrant social season, the house remained active year-round with a full staff. Cornelius II, the Commodore's favorite grandson, also constructed the largest private residence ever seen in Manhattan, the Cornelius Vanderbilt II house. Spanning six floors and housing 130 rooms, the colossal estate required 37 household staff and additional assistance for the Vanderbilts and their seven children. Sadly, after Cornelius II's passing in 1899, his widow Alice Vanderbilt was left with a trust fund of only $250,000 to sustain and manage both residences. However, this amount proved insufficient, and the expenses of maintaining the two houses quickly drained the Vanderbilt fortune. In 1926, Alice was forced to sell the Fifth Avenue home, which was ultimately demolished. Tragically, most of these magnificent residences met a similar fate in the late 1920s, as they were sold to real estate developers and torn down. Inspired by his relatives' opulent estates, George W. Vanderbilt ventured to Asheville, North Carolina to build Biltmore. Completed in 1895, the vast 30,000-acre estate features a magnificent 250-room French Renaissance castle. Costing nearly $6 million and equivalent to around $217 million today, Biltmore House remains the largest privately owned home in the country, cared for by Vanderbilt descendants. In contrast to their predecessors, the Commodore and Billy Vanderbilt, the third and fourth generations lived lavish lives, often squandering their fortunes on sprawling country estates used as summer retreats for only a few weeks each year. The 20th century brought changes including new taxes and the Great Depression, heavily impacting the Vanderbilt's finances and lifestyles. To cope, they opened and built more to the public in 1930, hoping to generate income to maintain the estate. Their lack of focus on wealth growth left them vulnerable to economic downturns compared to other wealthy families. As the family fortune was divided among numerous descendants who indulged in extravagant spending, the original source of their wealth, New York Central, began to decline in value. Advancements in transportation further impacted their business. Additionally, the Vanderbilts violated a fundamental rule of wealth preservation by depleting the capital instead of relying on investment returns. The consequences were evident in the lives of Cornelius II's sons, Neely and Reginald Claypool Vanderbilt, who were the first to squander their entire inheritances. Reginald's life took a tragic turn as he succumbed to liver cirrhosis at the young age of 45 in 1925 from excessive drinking. His reckless behavior, especially his gambling habits, had depleted most of his inheritance, leaving him penniless and burdened with debt. He left behind a widow and a baby daughter who relied on the interest payments from her $5 million trust fund until she turned 21. This daughter was Gloria Vanderbilt, who later gained fame as a fashion designer, writer, artist, actress, and socialite, notably making headlines in the early 1980s with her successful line of jeans. Despite her public success, Gloria made it clear to her son Anderson Cooper that there was no substantial trust fund left for him. By the late 20th century, barely a century after the Commodore had ascended to become the wealthiest man in America, with his son following as the richest man in the world, the Vanderbilt family fortune had dwindled to insignificance. When Gloria Vanderbilt passed away in 2019, Cooper inherited most of her estate, which was worth only $1.5 million, a stark reminder of the diminishing Vanderbilt legacy. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and turn on all notifications.